Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on wherever you are. Welcome to the DPG webinar. Today's session is on DevOps and the Data Professional by Hamish Watson. Uh, I'm Manohar Puna. I'll be hosting the webinar for you today. Dev Platform Geeks, uh, a couple of slides before we jump into the webinar. Dev Platform Geeks is a community initiative by eDominar Solutions, uh, which also masters in uh, SQL Server and other areas. Uh, they have companies with uh, SQL Mistros, PeopleWare India, and uh, uh, experts in SQL Server trainings in India. Data Platform Summit, uh, if you have, uh, if you're not aware of the conference that we hold in India every year, this happens in August. So this is the fourth edition of this conference happening on uh, between 9th to 11th August. And there are pre-conference trainings on 7th and 8th of August. Uh, please do check out the website, dps10.com. This is a three-day event, which will have more than 100 sessions with 50 speakers from all around the world, which is, uh, mostly the industry experts, MVPs, MCMs, and uh, most of the product team members from Microsoft will be here. It's a 100% learning event, and there are also two pre-con training events. It's a must, must attend if you're really serious about Data Platform. Here's the core team behind Data Platform Geeks. Amit Bansal, the founder of the uh, Data Platform Geeks. I'm myself, Manohar Puna. I'm the vice president of this group. Uh, and uh, Avnish Panchal, Prince Rastogi, Sandeep Pani, Yogesh Rapul, and Shurbi Agarwal are the regional mentors and also are the people driving their platform geeks and the whole community. We also have the eDomina teams, which help us in organizing these events and maintaining the data platform geeks uh, community website and all the other technical support that we need. So if you are attending this session, you would have already been registered on dataplatformgeeks.com. If not, please do register on the site because there's a lot of content in terms of blogs, videos, and uh, labs that are hosted on the site. So this is the biggest, uh, largest, Asia's largest data and analytics community. So there'll be experts from all around the world who will be helping you on this site. Uh, Please also join our Facebook group, where if you have any questions, we'll have so many experts who will be able to help you with these questions. Over to today's speaker. So Hamish Watson is a data platform MVP and a community enthusiast from uh, New Zealand. And I'll let Hamish to take over from here. Thank you, Manaha. Alrighty, let's get started. Alrighty, um, yeah, I'm from Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, I've been working in IT for a fair while and been managing SQL Server since uh, SQL Server 2000. Um, I've been bringing DevOps to a company, SQL Masters Consulting, since uh, January this year. Um, I'm a leader of a user group. And I like to get out in the community and speak. Um, and I was lucky enough to speak at Data Platform Summit in India last year, and it was a fantastic experience, one of the best conferences I've ever been to. Um, I'm also um, a Microsoft MVP, uh, got awarded last year. But in fact, the most important aspects of this uh, slide are pretty much here. I blog about um, Data Platform, and I also have a community email here. So if you ever want to ask me questions, please drop me an email. I like to answer questions and help people. So what are we going to do this morning, afternoon and evening, depending where you are? I'm going to introduce DevOps and explain it uh, in terms of data, how the data professional would see it. I'm going to discuss some DevOps tools, uh, more importantly, some database tools. Um, and I'm going to bring DevOps to, well, our database via a live demo. So what is DevOps? Well, there's a lot of different um, uh, ways of describing it. Wikipedia has um, a method of describing it. And in essence, um, development want to release awesome new features out to the masses. 
and see them take off in a huge way. Whereas operations, DBAs, want to make sure these features don't break anything. So there's kind of a power struggle with this whole um, situation. And ops want to put the brakes on as many releases as possible, whereas developers are looking for clever ways to sneak around those processes that hold them back. The other problem with DevOps is that there's so many buzzwords. And uh, you know, one week it's gamification, next week it's cloud, this week it's DevOps. And so this kind of um, confuses people on what DevOps is. So here's a couple of ways I like to describe DevOps. It's the ability to safely and quickly get changes into our prod systems. These changes have to be deployed in a sustainable way. There's no point doing them safely and quickly if we have a team of 100 people, whereas we only really want two. The deployments need to be predictable, reliable, and routine. We just want them to go without too much thinking on our part. We've got so many other things we need to be doing. And they should be, be able to be performed on demand. What this means is we want our code for both our applications and our database always in a deployable state. So that means that we can hit the button, make the deploy go. I like to wrap this up into one statement. DevOps for me is about using our tools, creating a process together that allows us to automate the reliable deployment or delivery of business value to our clients, i.e. the people that pay us. My definition of DevOps embraces all the continuousnesses. <laughs> the first one is continuous integration, and we'll go through this during my presentation. The next one is around, we want to do continuous testing. We then want to feed all this into continuous delivery. We want to wrap continuous monitoring around this because we want to scrutinize our performance. And we also need to bake in security because the more we can find out how insecure our application or database is um, earlier on in the piece, the better. And we wrap all this up together around continuous collaboration and communication. The reason why I've bolded the top three is they are the most important steps along this journey. Right, so typical database development life cycle. You know, it's manual. Um, it's inconsistently tested because testing is manual or even non-existent because we, the reason uh, we're, inconsistently testing things and doing them manually is because we have this fear of changing the database, i.e. the most important thing we have where all our data is, you know, the really critical data. <sighs> Typically, um, database development um, is played with poor or in fact no source control. Um, DBAs um, may not use source control at all. Um, and it's slowed down by lengthy processes. And the reason why it's slowed down by these things is that again, we want to do things manually. We want to put in heaps of manual checks and balances. And especially, you know, if we have a large complicated database and the application code breaks our database, you know, we do this massive deploy into prod and suddenly everything breaks. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. And I want to talk about continuous uh, delivery. Continuous delivery is about building quality in, i.e. performing unit tests. And those unit tests may be on um, our database code because application developers have been doing unit testing for decades. It's much cheaper to fix the problems and defects if we find them immediately, i.e. when we're writing the code. And ideally before we check into source control. We want to work in small batches. The reason being is that if we do things iteratively and in such a way that we can remember the code we wrote today rather than code we wrote three months ago when it goes into production. So this really, really helps, again, building quality in. And we want to use the computers. Humans, we're not very good at doing repetitive tasks because the phone goes, our concentration's broken, we need to get a coffee. Computers don't need coffee. The phone, they don't care if the phone rings. And we humans are far, far better at solving problems. And many people worry that automation will put them out of a job. This is not the goal. 
There will never be a shortage of work in a successful company that has embraced DevOps. Rather, people are freed up from the mindless drudge work to focus on higher value activities. And this has the benefit at improving qualities uh, because humans are at their most error prone when performing those manual, repetitive, mindless tasks. And we want to relentlessly pursue continuous improvement. We don't want to just sit on our laurels and go, well, we did this well. We, we want to continue on improving both our code, the application, everything. And everyone is responsible. There is no finger pointing. And there's a great concept about post, um, blameless postmortems, um, in that we all are working towards a common goal of automated, repeatable, reliable deployments. And again, bringing quality business value to our clients. And so working together um, means that we can, um, we can achieve this. Right. There's no point in embracing something unless there are benefits. The first one and the most major one is enhanced customer experience because by being able to have quality code going out to our databases, our applications, it means that we can continuously engage to um, obtain and respond to customer feedback. By being able to react and adapt to enhance our customer feed um, experience means that our customers are far, far happier. And by using the machines to do the automation, it means that we have increased capacity to innovate. So instead of us also having to waste time looking at problems and rework our code, we can start looking at better things like tuning our databases, looking at ways we can actually improve the overall performance of the system and it allows us to have faster time to value and how we measure this is um, up to the, the the company itself but having being able to deliver faster than our competitors has to be a good thing let's talk about continuous integration and I like to use this uh, animation we have a developer who writes code uh, commits it up to source control. We have an, another developer who also writes code, puts it up to source control. This goes into um, our continuous integration service, which will go across to our build server. We have a test failure. The developers immediately notified. They re, they change the code, fix it up. It goes back, passes the test. It's now committed, and we're ready to build and deploy. But we have to do proper continuous integration. Continuous integration is a development practice that requires developers to push that code up several times a day. Each check-in is then verified by an automated build, allowing teams to detect problems early, which means we can detect errors quickly and locate them easily. And I took this quote from uh, ThoughtWorks uh, on, on a post about continuous integration. This here is not continuous integration. We can see that when we check our main branch to some other branches, we're 6,960 commits behind. And I, I screenshotted this in August last year, so it was four months behind. That is not continuous integration. So I've bolded the bits here that remind us what continuous integration is. Continuous, isn't, continuous integration isn't the whole story for reliable deployments. So we might do all the good stuff of continuous integration, but then we bank up three months of changes that we've done in UAT and then release to prod. Something goes wrong in prod and now we have feedback on three months worth of changes. And so the development team then have to work out what went wrong, what changed in those three months during the you know, three deploys we did to UAT, and that's wasteful rework. I can't even remember what I did three weeks ago, let alone three months ago. So I'm gonna introduce the concept of shift left, and again, it's embracing all the continuouses. Um, 
it's a better way. So again, we're doing our continuous integration process, but we're deploying immediately to a continuous integration or build environment, and we're getting feedback immediately. We're also doing our unit tests and build tests along the way. But then what we do is we then roll out our deploy out to higher um, level environments. And these environments are prod-like. And what I mean by prod-like is that um, they will have the same schema, the same structure as our prod system, but they may be quite small. Our prod system might be one terabyte in size. These um, databases and systems might only be say 50 meg or 150 meg in size. But what we're doing is we're testing the whole way. And so that means our test, our application and database code is tested in an environment, close to production environment, that the application and database code will be delivered to. It enables operations and DBAs to see early in the cycle how the environment will behave supporting the application and code. And so we can finally tune things as we go along in this process. And the deploys are repeatable and therefore reliable because any any errors, any failures, we will pick up, remediate, and then start again through this process. And of course, people then say to me, oh, that will take ages doing this. It won't, because we're going to use automated deployment. The machines can do the work while we're doing what we're good at. And then after we've done all this, we will put it up to a pre-prod environment and then finally put it through to production. And what we do through this is monitor our systems the same the whole way through. And the reason we do that is again to scrutinize the um, performance. And so we can get some quality metrics. We can capture these, analyze them all the way through these environments here. This is a great example here of continuous delivery. These are deploys happening through our various stages of our um, application. And all these lower environments here are prod-like. I like to talk about the four pillars of DevOps. And in fact, I blogged about it for Redgate because uh, they're a great company who are listening to the community about things we want to um, do to our databases. And one of the first things about um, the four pillars is tools. We're technical people, we love tools. We like to make stuff go, cut code, etc. But more importantly, we need process. And what happened for uh, the company I used to work at is that we had great tools. We worked together, but our process was manual and disjointed. And so what we had to do was look at the process and how we use the tools. And that leads me into people because we need to have the right people. So I started with a like-minded developer years ago um, and worked together on our common goal of having that quality deployment into production that was both automated, repeatable, and reliable. And so what underpins this is culture because culture will always trump process. And what we need to do is if we are embracing DevOps, we need to start small. Rome wasn't built in a day, they say. And so we need to start small, get some wins on the board, or runs on the board, I should say, <laughs> um, and grow our culture around, again, that goal of automated, repeatable, repeatable reliable deployment of code, be it application code or database code, database changes. I have a saying, the tools are easy, but the process is wrong because the people don't get the culture. And so if you're looking at DevOps, you need to have people on board with the culture and then your process will drive how you use the tools. And when I say people, I'm saying everyone, all stakeholders in the delivery of our software or um, that's the lines of business, the executives, partners, suppliers, QA, engineers, infrastructure, DBAs, the developers, everyone is involved. 
There are quite a few tools out there. I thought I'd better bring it back to tools after talking about culture. Um, and I really love this from Xbeer Labs. Um, this shows you how many tools are out there. And tool choice is complex. It's what you need to do is, again, start small. Get a sand pit area that you can play in and just try things out. And more importantly, get other people in your company to try them out with you. Work together. The cool thing is, the time you invest choosing your tools, working on your process, you will get back. Because instead of doing deploys at three in the morning manually and then having to fix um, things that went wrong for two or three hours after that, you're not doing that. You're in asleep, hopefully. And so what that means is that the next day that you would have not been at work because you're asleep, you can spend time trying things out, moving forward and making your work life, and hopefully home life, better. So here are some tools that I use. Um, and yours might differ. So around our workflow, we might use Team Foundation Server. For source control, we might use, um, again, the version control um, built in Team Foundation Server. We're hopefully developing in Visual Studio. And our automated build, testing, and release servers may, in fact, all be Team Foundation Server. And I like to ch show this slide because, you know, if we're using the Microsoft stack, we're used to using Microsoft. But you know what? This is the real world. So some of these might be some other things. And so, you know what, that's okay. I don't care what tools you use. What I do care about is that you're looking at your process. You're collaborating with both developers, DBAs, infrastructure, testing, to find the best process that works for you. My process won't work for you, but hopefully yours will. And one important key thing is around infrastructure as code. This is the ability to spin up resources as we need them. Gone are the days where I had to wait a week or two for um, a database or, or a server to be spun up. And this is um, for a server up in Azure. And the cool thing about infrastructure as code is that it's code, so we can reuse it. It's source controlled, so we can version it. It's declarative, reusable, automated, and testable. The cool thing is, is that by spinning up our infrastructure uh, using automation, it means that we can have fast feedback because we spin up environments at the touch of a button. And in fact, the, um, our automated build server and deploy server may in fact spin these up on our behalf. And it's not about you know, people often say, oh, that will cost so much money. You can choose these to be as small as you like because during the testing of our app, we may not care about speed. We might, when we get up to say staging or pre-prod, fine, we'll use real big resources there. But down in the lower ends, no, we don't need to. Important is configuration management and we need configuration management so that all the resources, all the applications that we're spinning up, we're able to manage. And in fact, you can use PowerShell, um, DSC, Desired State Configuration. The cool thing about DSC is that you can declaratively configure your software, i.e. installing a package onto a server, you'll use DSC. You won't use a human who goes next, 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 chooses the wrong setting, next, 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 and then, you know, by using code and configuration management means that we can script all this out and more importantly, we can detect drift. So if we had servers that were built three months ago and we've got new features, we can programmatically bring those servers up, detect the drift and bring them to the level we want. Whereas doing that with humans, it is a huge, huge task. Our configuration management should be a repository of configurations, i.e. we have it in one location, it's um, visible to all the right people, and we can again use it in our code to manage our resources. 
And here's an example of Chef, uh, where in this example, we needed a new backup operator um, within our system. So we, again, we, we don't go onto servers, we don't do things manually, we're using code to create the resources and we can spin this out to thousands and thousands of servers, applications, whatever. Um, there's a couple of products that will help. Um, here's, here's some that I've used in my time. If you are a data professional, I really, really recommend you go to dbatools.io. The number of times this, um, the tools here have helped me has been, I've, I've lost count. DBA Tools is a community open source, which means it's free, effort by data professionals who have been there, done it, and want to help you. Please, if nothing else, you go there and have a look at some of the really cool tools that can help all of us. Right, so we need some techniques and tools to bring about database change. We can use ORMs, um, we can use SQL Server Data Tools, SSDT, and Resolvent DAC Packs. Again, we will use infrastructure as code, and if you are, have not learned PowerShell, you really need to. Um, and source control is paramount. We need everything in source control so that it is versioned, it is visible, and we know what the changes are. And we need standards. Standards are mandatory because as we start automating things out, both for our database and applications, um, having standards will be the foundation that will allow us to really, really make this work. Some people don't like ORMs, you know, like Entity Framework, Dapper, and those kind of things. It has its uses. Um, you know, this is the code first approach. And if you're a web developer and your database is just really just an object uh, operational data store, then ORMs are fine for what you want to do. It's migration based. Um, so developers track all changes in uh, sequence scripts and then those scripts are um, executed in order to migrate our downstream environments. It speeds development in certain cases. Um, it eliminates repetitive code like mapping query result fields to object members and vice versa. And it makes our data access more abstract and portable. I do recommend that if you are do go going down an ORM route, that you work closely with your DBA team. And it supports the encapsulation of business rules in your data access layer because some applications may actually need this. The business rules um, could be written in your application language of preference instead of you know triggers and stored procedures, if that's what you need. And it generates boiler code, uh, boilerplate code for base uh, create, read, update, and delete. But please be careful using ORMs. You can write horrid code easily. So what's SSDT? Well, firstly, does anyone remember? Data Dude. Data Dude was brought out in 2007 and was called Visual Studio Team System Edition for Database Professionals. Hence why it was, more, no, it was colloquially known as Data Dude. It allows developers to use their familiar and comfortable Visual Studio environments while allowing integration of database development into what they were doing with application lifecycle management, which is a concept of what DevOps can do. And so it allowed developers to do all these things, and more importantly, it allowed us to put some code into source control. And SSDT is the evolution of Data Dude because three things occurred. Data Dude proved to be popular, uh, Visual Studio was more integrated with SQL Server data, uh, tools, and SQL Azure kicked off in a big way. And um, so, yeah, Microsoft's um, definition of it is a good one. It's for SQL Server database developers who often develop schemas, views, stored procs, and other database objects while developing their business application logic. And that's important. It allows collaboration when we're de developing and deploying to our system. Um, SSDT um, allows us to um, Define the database schema and associated database objects using the DAC, Data Tier Application. 
which generates the DAC pack, the package containing all this. And it's used in conjunction with Visual Studio. We're developing our database changes as code. We're committing our changes to source control, um, typically as a peer project in our solution. And it means that we can push and deploy our DAC pack out to our databases or up into Azure. It's the same process essentially. And it's state-based um, uh, way of deploying. And there's a couple of ways that we can interact and use our DAC pack. We can use SQL package, Power, our good friend PowerShell. We can do it in Management Studio or we can code some APIs. And so DAC packs really allow us to utilize the shift left principles of continuous delivery, shift left where we're finding out and deploying to lower environments um, early on in our deployment um, pipeline. It also enables us to backfit prod-like environment creation. So we'll take a copy of our one terabyte prod system and then we will deploy out the DAC pack to create our build, our functional test, our UAT, et cetera. And there's a couple of people out there who really care about continuous integration and continuous delivery. Um, and I've put their Twitter handles here, uh, Steve Jones and Kent Chenery. Uh, these are two guys who really care about your database and have blogged about it. And we still need database administrators involved. This isn't unicorn magic. Um, DBAs need to be working with our developer to um, help tune the resultant systems and then feed that back into the code. And source control, it's pretty much like breathing air. Without source control, you won't die, but you might get sick. And so I always think of it like breathing clean air. And there's two types. Uh, there's distributed um, source control. Uh, and centralized and so the flavor at the moment is git um, it's where all the cool kids play but the thing is application developers have been spoiled SQL tools don't play nice with source control and so there's a couple of tools out there redgate do some really good stuff with source control there's source tree um, you know there's uh, git crack and there's a whole heap of tools out there that will help us DBAs out and uh, so this is source tree. Uh, you can do it in Visual Studio itself. Uh, you can use the git commands uh, if you really do like um, the command line. And so these are ways that we can uh, that we can get our um, code into git uh, source control rather. And we need DBAs more in DevOps. And there's a couple of um, blogs that have been written about this. Um, and one of them is around automations not killing the DBA. We actually just need smarter DBAs who get this. And it means that by automating deploys, we can now move on to higher value activities, i.e. tuning indexes. Those are always going to be needed and tuning queries. We're always gonna to need to do that. And it means that now by removing the manual, repetitive manual tasks, it means that we can do better things. You need to test your code. Um, data is hard, is what people tell me when I ask, why aren't you writing unit tests or why aren't you writing integration tests for your database code? This is more, even more reason to do the testing. If we lose data, this is terrible. If we do something wrong with the application, generally they just write and you know fix the DLL. But losing data, no way. The tests need to be repeatable, automated, and various kinds, i.e. unit tests, logical tests, integration tests, functional, quality assurance, and of course, user tests. And we want immediate feedback. And then what we do is we test for our mistakes so we don't repeat the same mistake. And test-driven development. So this is really important for understanding the end result of our code. By writing the test before we even write the code, we're putting ourselves in the shoes of our users. And this is a great thing because rather than relying on writing the world's best and elegant code, we're worrying about the effect of our code. And by writing the tests first, which drives our development, it means that we get better quality code. Yes, it does take a little bit of getting used to, but the rewards are far, far worth it. Okay, I'm gonna do a demo now of bringing DevOps to the database. And I'll just bring up 
So I have a VM here, um, and a, I have our good, um, familiar uh, SQL Server Management Studio. And what we have is a database here. Um, this is a copy of what our prod system will be. Um, we have a whole heap of tables. This is all good. Um, but at the moment, we have no stored procedures. So one of the first things we need to do is look at how we can, um, oh, sorry. Um, oh, uh, eek. right, just bear with me. Sorry about that. Um, slight issue. Right. Um, we're going to bring up um, Visual Studio. And what we'll do is we have a solution here, and it's pretty empty. There's uh, nothing in here. There's just a couple of things that I've already um, put in here. And so Visual Studio allows us to create uh, various projects. And the one that we want is SSDT, SQL Server Database Project. And so I've all I've done is gone file new here, renamed it, chucked in a few things. So I'm gonna bring in my database and I'm gonna choose that source database I talked about before. And all I'm gonna do is click kick off the import of that database, which will bring in the tables that we see here. And it's finished. And with that, we now have a representation of our tables. So all these tables here are exactly what we had in our source database. And what this now means is that I can represent these tables as code. And the good thing is that code is, so I can use um, the designer up here, or I can create and write code down here to represent my database. And so for that today, what I'm going to do is create a few things. Um, so first of all, I'm going to create a stored procedure. I'll just wait for this to spin up. And I'm going to call my um, stored procedure let's find risk stuff. And what that is going to do, we have a table called risk. And so this stored procedure is just gonna do some really simple things in our table. Now at this point, what I'd then do is create my unit tests. But for now, what I'll do is um, just put in uh, the code that I need to um, do my stored procedure. So here we have it. So all I have to do now is save it. What I do have is some database unit tests that I've already prepared. And um, so we will actually run these tests once I've published out my database. I'm also going to create a table um, and the reason I'll do this is purely just so that we can show um, during the deploy that something's turned up. So here's our table we're going to create. And for today, I'm going to call it Data Platform Geeks. Let's make it nice and topical. And again, I'm just going to use the code part of this I could have actually done all this up here, clicked here, chosen all those. So I will save that. So we're gonna have a table data platform geeks. Now what I need to do 
is a couple of things. I'm going to build my solution to check that it will actually build before I actually do anything. Um, Okay, this is good. I have a failure. And it's around uh, my stored procedure. So this again is um, DBO. Oh. Okay. All righty. this didn't fail in my tests of the test. <laughs> Alrighty, let's try the build again. If it doesn't work, I might um, remove. Okay. Has the model has an element that has the same name. Okay, um, I'm not gonna do that. Um, that's the good thing about um, these, uh, by building my code. Um, now what I'm gonna do is uh, I will do the build, make sure that it does actually work. Fantastic. What I'm now going to do is actually publish this to my dev database so that in future I can muck around in a dev database and, um, and find out all the things that might actually go wrong. So I'm going to publish that, and what it does is it's publishing to my local SQL Server instance. So if I click refresh here, I have this new dev database, and hopefully in here, I will have my stored procedure. Boom. And just note that that stored procedure did not exist in my source. Right, so that's part of the equation, but what I actually want to do is I actually want to run my unit tests against my stored procedure that I've already written. And so there is a couple of tests that I've written and so what they do is they check the database connection, they check that they can disconnect from the database and reconnect. Um, what it does is it gets um, risk data. Um, so it puts um, data into the risk table and compares to what we expect. Um, it then sends invalid data, make sure that that um, uh, comes back and fails, uh, which you want. And then we clean up after ourselves, after our test. So what you'll see now is that I have this linked all to, um, to source control. And so what I'll be doing is um, showing you uh, source control in a minute. So let's put in uh, DP Geeks demo. So I'm going to push this up to source control. And while that does that, I'm going to come into my, um, my automated build. System. So this is my, um, my system farm safety demo. And this is what we are pushing up to. And we have all of our code up here 
that is associated with, so I have my unit tests up here, um, and I now have my stored procedure, which I pushed up just now. Um, so that's been pushed up. There's the label that I put, DPG demo. And now what's happening is we're now doing our build. So this is all automated. So this is now going through and doing our builds. What it does is um, it also runs integration tests. So um, we apply some transforms, which I have listed here. Uh, so my app build config for my tests gets run against a build environment. And so when we're building the solution, it tears down this build environment. And the reason we do that is we want um, this build environment to match exactly what we have in source control because we're going to push source control out to our database. So what I want to talk about now is infrastructure as code while that build is happening. So what I want to do is do uh, to create a couple of databases up in Azure. And in fact, if I show you, so, oh, uh, while that build's going, uh, it's now testing against that build server. So up in Azure, I have, for this particular subscription, I only have one database, one SQL database, Azure SQL database. And I think it's CI. CI. So we're going to deploy to that immediately. And what does that look like up in Azure? So here's my Azure um, SQL database server. And there I have the CI farm safety database. So what I'm now going to do is run this infrastructure as code. I'm going to sign in. And so what this will now do is spin up the resources that I want created. So we want a UAT farm safety and a prod farm safety. And so that will create this in the background. So let's check on our build. which has succeeded. And so what it does is it's generated, it's taken our DAC pack that we use, the same DAC pack we use to deploy to dev, we're now using in our solution that we've built, we've done our tests, everything's working. Well, that's only part of the story. We now need to do our release. And so what we have here is some environments. So let's have a look at these environments. And so this is, I'm using team services here by Microsoft. You could be using Octopus Deploy, you could be using Jenkins to do the, this part of the process. Um, so I've used team services here to do both the build and release. And so we have a CI environment, an integration test environment, UAT and prod environment. And so they look like this and they have all variables because we want to variableize everything. And so at the moment, we're deploying to our CI environment and we're just pushing up the DAC pack that was generated. What will happen is it will fail on our integration test environment because I haven't done one thing. One of the cool things um, we have today is um, the fact that uh, we can now run SQL Server on Linux. And so what I'm going to do is start up SQL Server in Linux. And this is really good for um, integration testing because I can pull down um, Docker images as I want um, and then spin up um, 
whatever version of SQL Server I want. And it really is as simple as just run, running a code, a line of code. So this is the GA version of um, uh, SQL Server. This particular image of SQL Server here is the latest, I with CU3 um, applied. So hopefully this is fail. Oh yeah, it's about to run and it will fail fairly soon because it might. Okay, this is really good. But the reason I say that's good is because uh, this is my Docker um, SQL Server instance here and it had no databases. <laughs> um, and in fact, I'd only just started it up. And that's the real beauty of <clears throat> running SQL Server on Linux. It is so quick to actually spin up a database. So this is the integration farm safety database that I'm running on Linux, well actually in a container on Linux. And the really good thing is, as part of our integration test environment, if I show you, we actually do all of our tests in here. Uh, actually, I'll do it here, sorry. So we actually, Here's our CI environment, which was deployed to immediately. If that succeeds, it automatically goes into our integration test environment, which has two tasks. It runs the Visual Studio tests. It's running those integration tests that we built up over time. Okay, I wanna do one really quick thing just to show you the power of running um, SQL on Linux. So I'm actually going to run a, um, I'm going to run SQL Server using that image there that I pulled down here. And because it's a new image, it might take a wee while to start up, but let's try it. So this was, um, this. that's the other one. I use a port number just so that we can uh, tell. Now look at this. The version number between that one and that one is different because this is the GA one. This was when SQL Server was first released. This has got cumulative update three attached to it. So what this allows us to do is that this, just using code, being able to test our code against various different systems, right? So various levels of SQL Server. Alrighty, I'll just check if my infrastructure's code has finished. Cool, and what that means is that here, up in my SQL server up in Azure, we now have two new databases. And what that means is in our deployment pipeline, I've chosen to, for um, our UAT environment, I have to approve the um, the deploy actually I've gone one step too far so here a pre deploy so I can now choose to approve I could have set this up to deploy automatically just the same as integration did but what that means now is that our UAT environment that we just spun up the database for will be now deploying just one thing just to show you that this isn't all smoke and mirrors, our new integration database has the stored procedure that we created all the way back here in code. And that really is the beauty of implementing DevOps processes using automated builds, automated testing, and automated releases so that any issues will get caught first in our code, secondly, during our automated build um, uh, processes, and then as we go through our different environments. So I'm actually gonna let this go because um, we're getting close to time and uh, the deploy has worked. My writing code hasn't, uh, I've probably, yeah, got a carriage return, something, don't know. Anyway, so that's 
bringing DevOps to the database, being able to automatically, repeatably, reliably deploy changes to our databases. The game changes for, for this. Infrastructure as code and configuration management, being able to script things, being able to script various levels of SQL Server and scripting tests against them. Source control for everything. By having things in source control, they're versioned, we can um, see what changes there are, there is a, a change history. We have so much more information and we can collaborate. We need to do far more testing. Um, there's a cool framework, T SQL T. Um, and when I do this, do a variant of this session on um, doing testing, I show T SQL T um, and a whole heap of other free frameworks that you can use. We, the aim is reliable automated deploys on prod like systems. So we take prod, we take, um, a copy of it without the data, just the structure, the schema, the setup, what have you, and we deploy against it. We want to fail quick in our continuous integration environment, and in my case, in the development environment, and celebrate lots in prod. I actually want our prod deploys to be boring, just mundane. And Azure is fantastic. And look, you can use AWS, Amazon Web Services, or any cloud infrastructure you want, but it really helps us to spin up resources as required. So those two databases I spun up, I will tear down if I don't need them. And that's the beauty. We'll just spin resources up, test, and then tear them down because that saves money. <laughs> right, summary. Um, again, the goal is repeatable, rapid, reliable, and automated delivery of working software systems into prod. We will not do any out of process changes ever. Everything goes through build, through test, through continuous integration, and then through our release process. Don't ask to underestimate unit tests and test-driven development. This, they will help make your code better. We need experienced DBAs and devs. They are integral to achieving the goal, and automation is cornerstone. The things that will help you succeed our communication, collaboration, and culture. Without these, DevOps will fail for you, and you'll just be doing the same things you're doing now. Um, we need to communicate, we need to collaborate, and culture will underpin everything. For too long, um, application developers have been doing brilliant things, and for too long, we've had two separate deployment conversations about application and and databases. We need to start treating them both the same so that our data is not at risk. We need to embrace the concepts of DevOps for us data, data platform professionals. Alrighty, um, I don't know if there's any questions. Um, if there are, um, please send um, them through to my community email address here. I'm on Twitter. And I do write about some of the things I've presented today. And at this point, I will hand over to um, Manu um, because I have finished my presentation. And here's just a few slides to reiterate um, what Manaha was speaking about before. Thank you, Himish, for the wonderful session. Uh, a couple of slides before we uh, get to Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, please drop your questions in the Q&A panel. Uh, if not, you can uh, always go back to Facebook group and uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of experts who will be able to answer your questions. Um, a quick word from our sponsor. Uh, SQL Maestro's Learning Solutions, they have a lot of, uh, they do a lot of advanced trainings in SQL Server and the Microsoft Data Platform space. Hands-on Labs is a wonderful product of SQL Maestro's where you can actually uh, go and do things. So the best way to learn about about uh, data platform or any anything is actually to go and try it with your own hands. So Hands-on Labs gives you that experience where you can actually download the labs and uh, 
uh, learn new things. There are also on-site trainings and SQL Server health checks that SQL Maestros perform. So please uh, do visit sqlmaestros.com. Uh, this is a glimpse of what labs they have. So few of the labs are free, but uh, you can go and try them and a lot other labs are uh, paid under the paid subscription. So please go and try it out. Uh, thank you for your time, uh, taking your time and joining the webinar today. And thank you, thank you Hamish for giving a wonderful session. Uh, if you do have any questions, please do post them. At this point, I don't see any of them. so. We'll uh, we'll uh, we'll look out for the questions and please do post your feedback. We'll be posting the a pic about this webinar on the Facebook group. So please do post your feedback there. Thank you everyone and have a great day.